مصرف في لبنان في واحد على اخر الحمراء هون قبل شارع السوداء Welcome to iFeel Museum. My name is Nat Muller and I'm the guest curator of Trembling Landscapes Between Reality and Fiction. In this exhibition we're showing 11 of some of the most prominent artists of the Arab world who are working with film and video. And landscape is a very contested notion in the Middle East. It's part of identity, it's part of history, it's a rich source for the imaginary, but obviously the Middle East is also a rather contested territory. It has a colonial history, there's battles over resources, which means that landscape is a very rich trope to tell stories about history, about past, about the present and also about the future. And this is what we're trying to show here in this exhibition through a variety of very diverse voices. This work is a work by Egyptian artist Heba Amin, and it's called The Earth is an Imperfect Ellipsoid. In this work, Heba Amin places two timelines together. One is that of Al-Bakri, who is an 11th century geographer and historian who used to live in Andalusia. He wrote about the trans-Saharan trade routes in West Africa, but he had never visited the places he wrote about. In his accounts, he writes about landscapes by describing women in a sexualized manner. Heba compares this to the migrant routes that African refugees travel when they go to Europe. So we have two different timelines that intertwine and intermingle. In both cases, landscape is seen as predatory. In one part of the project, we see that Heba travels to all these countries in West Africa that are describes, described in Al-Bakri's accounts. She goes to Mauritania, she goes to Senegal, she goes to Morocco, and so on. Her journey took more than five months and almost three dozen visas. For Heba, it's very important that she places her body as an Egyptian woman, as an Arab, um, as someone who also understands the precarity of mobility and of landscape in these contested countries. She films these landscapes through a theodolite, and a theodolite is an ancient land measuring instrument. So it's a way to control landscape, it's a way to look at landscape in a way that expresses its metrics, um, it's in a way also to colonize landscape. And Heba in this work wants to flip not only the colonial view, but she also wants to flip the masculine view. So that's why it's important that she's present in these sites. In the other part of the project, Heba uh, films herself on a boat from Africa to Europe. And she also films this through the theodolite. So you have the idea that she is a voyeur because it's filmed as if through a peephole, but she's also a witness. This is a work by Mohammed Hafida called Suing the Borders. Mohammed is a researcher, an artist, and an academic. And in his work, he's very much interested in narratives of displacement, migration, and borders. Mohammed was born in Beirut and grew up in the city during the Lebanese Civil War. So he's quite accustomed to the visions that a city like Beirut brings with it. For this project, he worked with disenfranchised community in the city of Beirut. People who have a background either as Palestinian refugees coming from 1948 or 1967, uh, people with a, a Kurdish background coming from Iraq, Palestinians, Syrians, or Armenians who came at the time of the Armenian genocide. In a way, they're all dispossessed and marginalized residents of Beirut. What they share, though, is that they actually are very good at sewing. Mohammed asked these residents to show on maps how they navigate the material and immaterial borders of Beirut. For example, how do they avoid checkpoints? How do they avoid the police? How do they move through a city that at times is a hostile environment? 
They do this by taking maps of Beirut and of the larger Mid Middle Eastern region and with a sewing machine they actually materialize how they move through this city. In this exhibition we're showing Muhammad's maps for the first time and in these maps we see how residents trace not only their own individual journeys and histories, how for example they fled from Baghdad to Beirut or how their grandparents came from Jaffa to Beirut in 1948. These are personal and individual stories but they're also part of a larger collective identity that is shared in the region. At the backdrop of Muhammad's work are also international treaties, like for example the 1916 Sykes-Picot Agreement. In this agreement, the French and the British colonial powers agreed to carve up the Middle East. And we still feel the result of that geopolitical treaty to this day. <laughs> حلمنا نحن كأكراد تصير كردستان. Why isn't the news happening in the Senate? Why do the senators sit there without legislating? Once the barbarians are here, they'll do the legislating. What laws can the senators make now? This work is called Waiting for the Barbarians and is by two Lebanese artists and filmmakers, Khalil Jorej and Joana Jituma. Both of them were born in Beirut in 1969 and came of age during the Lebanese Civil War, which raised from 1975 till 1990. Much of their work has been about the aftermath of the Lebanese Civil War and its memory and what kind of images it has produced. They ask, what kind of history is there in a place where history is unaccounted for? The war might have ended in 1990, but the political situation has not been resolved. They based their work on a poem by Constantine Cavafy. He was a Greek poet and um, born in Alexandria in the 19th century. The poem is from 1898. It was at Britain at a time when Alexandria was experiencing a kind of regeneration. So Cavafy writes about political inertia and about a class of politicians who don't move. They're always waiting for something to happen and the barbarians are the thing that actually prevents them from taking any action. It's an apt metaphor what's happening in Beirut and has been happening in Beirut since the Civil War. What we see is a beautiful panoramic view of the cityscape of the Lebanese capital. And the artists have composed over 50 photographs and moving images to provide a diorama that somehow provides a tension between static image and moving image. So there's always a tension that something is about to happen. It's a beautiful landscape, but it's terribly ominous. In the video, we also see two suns appearing at the sunset. This is a textual reference to a play by Euripides, the Greek dramaturge, in which Pantheus, kings of Thebes, sees double, and it's actually an omen for tragedy. Nowadays, when we look at the city of Beirut, and particularly after the devastating explosion of the 1st of August, we really have to ask what's on the horizon for Beirut and Lebanon at large. This is a work by Palestinian artist Larissa Sansour, and it's called Nation of State. For the past 10 years, Larissa has been working with science fiction as a means to narrate the plight of the Palestinian people in futurist scenarios. For her, it's a way to address issues such as nationalism, trauma, and identity. In Nation of State, Larissa offers us a science fictional film that is dystopic, but also humorous. Instead of dealing with permits and checkpoints and traversing the very fragmented Palestinian landscape, Larissa's solution is to show the Palestinian people in one luxury giant skyscraper. So if you want to go from Gaza, for example, to Jerusalem, you just go by elevator. There is no problem whatsoever. What's also important in this work is Larissa's way of critiquing national symbolism. 
Because what does a flag mean? What does the kafia, the traditional Palestinian headdress mean? What do keys mean, which are very important for Palestinians if you don't have a sovereign homeland? In nation state, these questions are all addressed ironically and also darkly. But science fiction is a very important means to show to an audience that Palestinians take over the future in their own hands. Another thing that's important to point, point out about this work is that Larissa also insists that Palestinians and also other artists from the region also can use very polished imagery and aesthetics to make a point. In other words, an authentic image is not necessarily documentary or grainy. Accompanying the film, we're also showing a poster, and the poster also comes back in the video. The poster is based on a poster Franz Krauss made in 1936. Franz Krauss was uh, a Jew, a German Jew, and a graphic de designer who actually made uh, tourism posters for Jewish people to come and visit the Holy Land. And it said, visit Palestine. It's a poster you can find everywhere nowadays in the old city of Jerusalem. Originally, Krauss made this poster in 1936 to encourage Jewish tourism to the Holy Land. But now it has become a site of resistance. And in Larissa's poster, we see the nation state tower dwarfing the rest of the scenery. In this space, we're showing work by Janan Al-Ani, an Iraqi-born artist. Two projections, Shadow Site 1 and Shadow Site 2. They're based on long-term research Janan has undertaken on the relationships between imaging technologies such as photography and aviation, particularly military aviation. Shadow Sites show um, a few things. Uh, its term is derived from avian archaeology. And it means the point at which the sun is at low position and casts long shadows. And somehow you can then discern things in the landscape that otherwise are invisible. So it's a tool basically to see um, that what is perhaps underground or to track traces that are normally not visible to the eye. Shanan went to the Middle East and hired a plane and flew over a landscape. For her, the Middle East is comprised of contested landscapes. And the first film, Shadow Sites 1, is made up of 16 millimeter projections. We see very dreamy landscapes that range from the agricultural to the industrial. Some are old, some are new, and they show us traces of human presence. But now the body of the human is taken completely out of this image. Shadow Sites also shows that the skies in the Middle East are not innocent anymore. In Shadow Sites 1, the view is one of mastery from above. It evokes the threat of surveillance and of controlling a territory and the landscape. In Shadow Sites 2, Shanan focuses on photographs that are animated and they zoom in on a specific site. So the idea it evokes is one of a predator drone on which the drone locks on its target. In other words, the view from above is also a weaponized view and a military view. And it's one that has continued to dominate how the Middle East is seen. In Shadow Sites 1 and 2, we are taken in between the tension of a very seductive image, a mesmerizing image, and a very painterly image. But at the same time, these are also weaponized views and ominous images. We're standing here in the Incidental Insurgents Part 3, an audiovisual installation by Basil Abbas and Rawan Abu Rahme. In their work, they actually do a lot of sampling of other people's texts, um, their own texts, images, and other documents. And the Incidental Insurgents is actually a road trip 
you could say, through the West Bank city of Ramallah, which is a city Basel and Rawan spent considerable time in. The whole installation speaks of defiance. In this installation, they're looking for a new political imaginary, one that's not rooted in the past, but one that suggests something new. So the viewer is enveloped in something that's speculative and immersive, and the whole journey through sound and images. Alongside the four large projections in the back and one in the front, there's also three smaller projections, and they're accompanied by little watchtowers. In the space, those little watchtowers are interesting objects and they suggest surveillance. However, when we look at the projection in the image, they become threatening presences, presences that also cut through the Palestinian landscape. Sound is as important in this piece as image. Its beats and rhythms become threatening, ominous, but also take the viewer on a journey with the incidental insurgent as its guide. And the incidental insurgent is a figure who is part rebel, part artist, part vagabond, but definitely a figure that takes us into new possibilities in this diverse and spectacular landscape. We're here in uh, Al-Araba Al-Matfuna, number two, a work by the Egyptian artist Wael Shawki. Wael was born in Alexandria, but also grew up in Mecca in Saudi Arabia. And in his work, he's very much interested to trace and explore issues of national identity, of spirituality, and um, also of mythology. In Al-Araba Al-Matfuna, which is the eponymous name of a small village in Upper Egypt, we see child actors and um, they are dubbed in adult voices, speaking the scripts or actually reciting the scripts that are based on the stories of Muhammad Mustagab. And these are phantasmagorical stories um, of magic, of suspicion, and of all kinds of make-belief. In Al-Arab Al-Matfuna, these stories are, are countered by the very magical and wondrous landscapes of the riverbanks of the Nile in Upper Egypt. We also see the wonderful and magical pigeon towers in the landscape. <laughs> One story is about how in the village everyone loses their ability to speak, but in the end they make do. Another story is about how successive horsemen try to uh, depose a despotic ruler, but they fail. In the exhibition we also show some of Wael's drawings on Al-Araba Al-Matfuna. And as the film is black and white and quite formal, and the actors speak in fusha, in classical Arabic, it feels very theatrical, it feels very performed, but the drawings are very free and magical. And we see all kinds of creatures that are coming from fairy tales, but become one with the landscape. We see the return of mountains, of the pigeon towers, and of cities. Ali Sherry is a Lebanese artist who's interested in ruin, catastrophe, history, memory, geology, heritage, and archaeology. And in this work, Trembling Landscape, from which this exhibition borrows its title, we see six lithographies that show us aerial maps of six cities in the Middle East. Standing behind me is Beirut, but we're also showing Mecca, Damascus, Algiers, Erbil, and Tehran. And these cities are known also for political tension. However, they're also situated on geological fault lines. They are also sites of seismic activity. And these geological fault lines are stamped with red coordinates on the lithographies. So in an interesting way, Ali shows us that on the one hand, there's something that we see from above, but there's also something that's invisible underground. And this tension is played out in this work.
Lebanon and the city of Beirut quake a few times a day. They are on seismic geological fault lines. And Ali shows us the history of earthquakes in Lebanon. The city of Beirut has been destroyed many times. There is a tendency to view Lebanon and also Beirut through the lens of political history only. But in the disquiet, Ali teaches us to take a longer historical view and also look at the geological timeline of this region. In the film, Ali also incorporates archival images, documents and stamps to show us how this temporality of geology and of human history coincide. Mabainit haddit, ahla hujjiru, shajar tallait, met akhtar min tlatin alf insan, kersi. Raya Sarkisian is a Syrian artist of Armenian origin. In the video Homesick, we see two screens. One shows Raya wielding a sledgehammer. The other screen shows a replica of Raya's parental home. The artist left Damascus in 2008 to study abroad, but his parents have continued to live in Damascus. Raya was actually trained in his father's photography studio in the capital city of Syria. And as the video progresses, we see the artist becoming more strained, not only physically, but also emotionally. In a way, the ruin of a home is not only an individual story, but it's also a collective story of dispossession, of loss, that people who live through conflict experience. This video shows a violent act of iconoclasm, where the artist tries to destroy an image that's really dear to him, and in the process hopes that this won't happen in reality.